All right. So um, I am focusing on this as Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, but it'll it's because of the meta narrative kind of um, structure of this game that I'm really talking about both Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation and Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. Um, and so in this paper, I'm going to um, kind of close read two contextual pieces in the game, um, Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, um, an audio log and an email chain that's um, within kind of the frame story of the game in order to argue that these pieces are offering the promise of understanding new perspectives, um, but also critiquing the idea that like representing more women, white or of color um, in video games allows for a pure experience of the other and kind of getting to know what it's like to be a woman in the world. Um, so this kind of promise, but also this Kind of understanding that that's a problematic um, assumption for if, if for more diversity in video games. Um, in addition, these pieces kind of jab at the assumed target audience, um, heterosexual white males, who are the kind of idea of what the ideal gamer is um, in uh, in series series like Assassin's Creed um, and also the AAA gaming industry itself. Um, so we'll get started. So um, just a little bit of background, because I'm not sure, how, like, have any of you played Assassin's Creed games before? Yeah, they're awesome. Um, but, you know, they're awesome, but we're going to think about them a little critically. So um, some background about <laughs> the Assassin's Creed um, franchise is that it is developed by Ubisoft Montreal and published by Ubisoft, a major gaming company. Um, and the first game comes out in 2007, just Assassin's Creed. Um, it's a AAA game, and when I say AAA game, what I mean is that it has a large um, developing budget and also a large marketing budget um, as opposed to like indie games. Um, the genres are kind of the, the genres that we usually see it associated with are historical fiction, um, action adventure, open world and stealth. Um, and Assassin's Creed when it first came out, though probably not so much anymore, was considered very innovative because it took the historical fiction genre and really like instead of placing it in World War II like every other video game in the world does, it decided to pick time periods that weren't really like done in video games, starting with the Crusades, um, including the Renaissance, um, and um, also thinking about um, having a Native American protagonist in the third game um, during the American Revolutionary War. So there were some pretty innovative things going on, um, and there's, there's still people who would argue certain parts of it are innovative. Um, this kind of major conflict in the story is just the assassins who believe in like ultimate freedom and the idea that there is no truth and the Templars who believe in order and the idea that their truth is the, is the truth, right? Um, um, Assassin's Creed 4 is a game that focuses primarily on piracy um, in the Caribbean during the Golden Age. Um, and, but it in itself is also a meta narrative. Um, as the player, what you are doing is you are a game tester for a game about piracy. Um, and you are playing it not through a video game console like Wii U or, you know, PlayStation 3, but through something called an Animus. Um, in the first three games, there's this major story arc in which people, where it's this particular character um, was going through the Animus so that he could relive the experiences of his ancestors so that he could help save the world. That's kind of the ultimate goal of it. But at this point, by Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation and Assassin's Creed 4, that storyline is, story arc is over. So they've kind of gone into this meta narrative of, starting off with you as a game tester for Abstergo Entertainment, which is run by the Templars. Um, and in that narrative, you're kind of learning about, um, you're kind of learning about like the Templars censoring particular parts of the history so they can put out their own propaganda. And that happens both in Assassin's Creed 4, but also Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation, um, which itself was a handheld game, um, which often means it's not considered a mothership title or kind of part of the, the main canon of the series. Um, and but it revolved around what was considered the first female protagonist. So she's also she's a black female protagonist. She's a African French free woman in New Orleans at the end of the French and Indian War, kind of to the beginning of the um, uh, Revolutionary War. So it was she was you know considered pretty. In, it was the, the innovative being able to like play as a black female character, but also put on a handheld um, device that not a lot of people own, the PS Vita. Um, but it became pretty popular to the point that within by the beginning of 2014, they had ported it to larger um, consoles, um, to the PS3 and also to the PC through Steam, um, so that you could play as it. So it was fairly popular um, and was had some interesting game mechanics that um, didn't didn't exist in the other games. Right. So within the um, within the story, Assassin's Creed Four, um, the things I'm focusing on are actually like talking about this game, which also existed within Assassin's Creed 
four <laughs> as like the first game that Upstairs Entertainment comes up with. So it's like very meta in this very strange way. Um, but I think it's really talking about the video game industri industry in pretty important ways too. Okay. Um, so thinking about just kind of close reading games, because um, we're all going to be talking about, you know, games or the gaming industry. And there's a lot of questions about what is actually um, what can, you can do. How do you analyze games, whether we even should analyze games, right? That's why people like Sarkeesian are kind of not liked because they're really thinking critically about games and not always in ways that people agree with. Right. Um, but that's because also like what a game is not a book. Like it is something more than that. Games are texts and narratives. Assassin's Creed does have a narrative. However, also there are a lot of visual aspects, a lot of oral aspects, um, interactivity. Like you are a person playing this game. Like are you, how much are you taking on that persona? How are we mediating um, the game and the gamer? Um, thinking even to the, like the level of programming and code, um, thinking about production and development. How do we even get these games to come out? Like, right. And who decides? Um, how does the market play into these things? So there's a lot of ways we could close read a game, which is why I kind of tried to pick out something that I feel like is a little, I wanted to kind of very focus very specifically on these, these two kind of texts within the game that are not very interactive. And they're actually found only if you decide like me to like do everything. I'm very completionist, <laughs> like to have everything. So you have to hack a whole bunch of consoles in the game to find these particular um, texts. So there's a, there's a way in which like as a gamer, if you've played this game, you might never have seen these. Um, if you're not someone who just was interested in kind of finishing the story and uh, seeing what happens with the pirate. Right. Um, so I'm going to kind of focus on thinking about the dialogue, the voices, um, kind of the context of the video game industry itself. Like, what is it? How is it kind of being a meta narrative on that? And also, like, how these kind of fit into the game. Um, so. Okay. Um, so there are a whole bunch of these audio logs, videos, images um, found throughout the game by hacking these computers. Um, again, it's possible for some gamer, gamers not to find these at all. Um, and um, this audio log that I want to like have you listen to a portion to before I kind of close read it um, is actually like said that it's set in February 1981. Um, and it's discussing this kind of fictional, I'm calling him a gamer, but he's really supposed to be a research subject who's researching the character of Aveline, who's the kind of black female protagonist of Assassin's Creed III Liberation. Um, and he's talking about what it was like to be in the Animus as her. Um, so I'm going to have us listen to like a chunk of it. Now it's a six and a half minute clip and it's definitely worth listening to because it's very just provocative, but we're going to start um, kind of like a minute in and listen to like three or four minutes of it. And then I'm going to talk about that. So. Like I can smell more than I usually can. In general, women have a more acute sense of smell than men do. I had wondered how that would translate. Anything else? Yeah. She's smaller than me. But it's like her body could do more. Did that surprise you? At first, yeah. The ERA people might hate me for this or whatever, but I don't usually think of girls that way. Climbing things. My mom, my sisters. The animal feeling of Aveline sinking her hidden blade in her throat of... Go on. It doesn't feel... feminine. What I think of as feminine. But then at the same time it does. Her center of gravity is way lower. That was a surprise. How easy it is to land. How steady I am on her feet. I'm sorry. This is hard to talk about. No, it, it's fascinating. This is what we need. Pure experience, in your own words. Okay. Can you tell me about Gerald Blunk? What about him? He and Avalon were close, but we haven't been able to ascertain if he might be your missing ancestor. Do her memories suggest anything to you? Um. Does this make you uncomfortable? <laughs> Remember. These are her memories. You're just playing them back. It's not even acting. You're a researcher. But like you say, I haven't experienced her consummating anything. <laughs> that, that would be... Anyway, I think maybe she was confused. Oh. Well, um, first of all, I don't really know for sure, okay? I mean, guys think about sex more than girls, right? That's a fact. As a researcher, what did you observe? <laughs> Does it mean she's more like a guy when she thinks about them? Is that why she's able to assassinate <laughs> Oh, okay, here's the thing. I don't know her thoughts, 
but from what's in her memories, physically, the, the, the fidgeting, some hesitation, what she looked at, who she looked away from, the things she didn't say when I expected her to. If I had to guess what it meant, I would think she was thinking about sex. But I'm a guy, so I would think that, right? So what does it mean for women to act that way? Uh, it has to mean something else, right? As a subject, you're able to observe more finely than I am in review. <laughs> what about unwanted attention from men? Well, I thought that would be the hardest thing to deal with. I'm not in a vet, for the record. Not at all. Yes, and I know. But the way she dealt with it, it happens so often. She, it's like you stop noticing everything she does to avoid it. Crossing the street, eyes in the back of her head. She knew how to handle herself. When she was charming, felt kind of similar to killing. Or the build-up to killing. I... Can we take a break, Mr. Biddick? Of course. I have one more little section. We're ready to go on? Yes. Avalyn was black. And white. On her father's side. You're sensitive to that? I guess. I mean, I'm white. Avalyn looks black, so that's different. But y you get used to it. Like, with the girl thing. Until someone makes you not used to it. <coughs> what do you mean? I don't think I've ever had to think so much about what I'm wearing or how I'm walking. But Avalyn, it's like she goes through her whole life in these uniforms. People expect her to behave in a certain way. <coughs> Definitely. Okay. So I'm going to stop there. But the whole thing is, of course, as you can see, really interesting, right? So this type of, um, one, right, like we can read this very clearly. They want us to read this as a heterosexual white male speaker, right? He's very afraid of being considered gay, right? He um, is clearly thinking, like, it's weird getting used to being a girl, Right. Um, there's the, the way that we really are supposed to assume like this target audience. Um, and it's something really interesting about the fact that he's literally embodying right this black freed woman. Like it's not even the way that we play a video game in which we're like, I'm playing as this player and like the character is this. Like he's in her mind. He's in her thoughts. He feels what she feels physically. Um, and it's very um and he has a hard time differentiating between himself and her when he says like how steady I am on her feet. Right. Um, there's this idea that he doesn't know where she begins. Right. And, and kind of he ends. Um, and that makes the animus obviously very different from like a video game in itself, um, because it's but it's also very aware of how even when we're playing video games, we're mediating our own lived experience through it. Right. Which is why it can't just be we can know what it's like to be a black woman because we played as one in a video game. Right. Um, but at the same time, the researcher really wants him to provide this like ethnography of like what it was like to be this black woman in New Orleans. Um, and he's like, really, you know, this is 1981 as well. But like if we could even get people to think about gender expectations this critically in video games today, it'd be amazing. Um, but like he's really thinking about like the fact that her physical strength, her ability to kill, the fact that women think about sex, too. Um, these are things that are really troubling to him. They don't. Um, they and and they're so troubling that he's afraid that his own masculinity is actually um, interfering and creating a hindrance to understanding what she's actually thinking, right? So he's not even sure if he can attribute those thoughts about sex or about anything else to her because he's afraid that actually it's him, right? It may be because maybe he doesn't want to think that like his idea of femininity of womanhood is different than what he's imagined. <laughs> Um, and yet also at the same time, he's like, she's really strong, but she also still feels feminine, her like center of gravity, all these other things. So he's having this hard time balancing the fact that he, this isn't what he thought women were like, and yet he kind of still wants them to be how women were like, right? Um, and also the fact that he doesn't want to bring up Avalyn's race. Like, as you can see there, she is a black woman, right? But yet he, the researcher has to bring that up and he's like, oh, but she's half white. Um, and wants to re is really sensitive to the idea that she's half white and that this idea of her phenotype is the only really thing that's um, that's kind of clouding that idea that she's that she's also white like him. Um, and also the of course the most I think the most interesting thing is noticing the fact that she wears and this is actually a game mechanic um, uniforms. She in the game she is wearing personas and disguises and she is acting um, particular ways. Um, but it also really talks about black women's hyper visibility and the fact that she is. Quite 
crossing the street everywhere. She knows everybody's looking at her, right? And this is very uncomfortable for him because he's not used to that, right? So it's giving him this idea of like this like, oh man, like these realizations of what it's like to be a woman. Um, while at the same time, as we were laughing and joking, the dialogue is very stilted sounding. Like it even sounds kind of ridiculous. Some of the things that are happening, a little absurd um, in a way. Um, and I think that's part of the fact that like, this is only one piece of many other things that are pointing towards um, these critiques about male gamers, about the industry, um, because I'm not gonna have enough time. I did have some other ones and I can talk about some other examples within the game that I think are making this critique. Um, but I think that, you know, he's, like, you know, he's really offering us these kind of thoughts about the things that men don't think about until they actually have to think from a woman's point of view, but also making us question whether or not it's even possible to think from a woman's point of view, right? Like, what is, what is this promise? This promise that, like, if we had more diverse games that people would understand each other better, um, might not be, a, might not really, might be more of, like, the idea of, like, now I know the other in some really troubling ways. Um, but it, but it is like an interesting offering of promise, but also like, and whether they mean to do this or not, offering kind of this critique um, of the idea of diversity, which I think has been misused in lots of ways of diversity, allowing us to have like a better university or a better gaming community or anything else like that. So, um, and I can offer again, some more examples because I had some other kind of um, interesting examples from the game as well. Um, but I think that's, I think that's good for now. So thank you very much. Ooh, good job. <laughs> it's like, how do I get out? Like, well, I think I'm just pulled up on Prezi on the line. And you have the mouse now. I'll let you. Ha ha. Let's see how quickly it takes for me to mess this up. All right. So I'm going to be talking about uh, very similar issues. I think Regina already brought up some really fantastic points about how, when it comes to video game criticism, the community is still struggling to define its methodology. We're somewhere in this realm where we're trying to think about issues of narrative and storytelling, but we're also dealing with things like player interaction, interactivity, the role of the interface, this notion of limited autonomy for players, right? So there you go, there's a thumbnail preview. I'm also gonna talk about these things. But I'm going to do it through a game called Bioshock Infinite. So Bioshock is the brainchild of game developer Ken Levine, and the franchise is really notorious for dealing with American political philosophy. The first game, Bioshock, essentially takes as its premise what would happen to society if um, uh, Randian objectivism or extreme libertarianism uh, ran wild. The conclusion, if you're wondering, is zombie survival guide. Uh, so Bioshock Infinite, which is the third installment, moves away from looking at uh, libertarianism and starts examining uh, American exceptionalism and theocratic fundamentalism. So Infinite argues that there's some sort of ingrained link between zealous national exceptionalism and institutional classism and racism. And this is where I think Infinite gets particularly interesting because like the Assassin's Creed games, it had a really big development budget. It sold a ton of games. I think in the first couple of months, uh, over two million copies were sold. I think now we're up around seven million. So Infinite, it's being played by a lot of people. But even though it's a mainstream game, it sells itself as a commentary against politically sanctioned discrimination and as a game that's really invested in demonstrating the moral and ethical bankruptcy of racism. But I want to look at the game really in depth and explore exactly what it's trying to say about race. A little bit of background for those of you who haven't, who haven't experienced the game. So Bioshock Infinite is set in the floating city of Columbia, an extremist society ruled by the principles of religious fundamentalism and American exceptionalism. The player explores this culture as Booker DeWitt, an ex-Pinkerton agent turned private investigator who served as a soldier during the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890. Booker traverses Columbia looking for a mysterious girl named Elizabeth, who he later learns and this is where the fantasy comes in, right? Can manipulate space-time by opening dimensional portals called tears. During his quest to take Elizabeth out of Columbia, the pair is thrown into the socio-political upheaval of the city. 
The city's upper class, comprised of wealthy white citizens, struggles to retain power while the Vox Populi, a grassroots revolutionary group, fights for the rights of oppressed racial minorities and the poor. While the story closely follows the adventures of Booker and Elizabeth, the city around them slips from dystopic utopia, where the happy, observable rich exploit the seldom seen poor, to the dystopic dystopia, where a veritable Marxist revolution has thrown everything into violent chaos. So exactly how do we go about constructing an ideological critique of something like Bioshock Infinite? How do we, to uh, rip some words from one of the game's characters, conduct this experiment knowing we could fail? Coming from a background in literary criticism, I'm really used to relying on things like narrative elements when I'm building critiques. Things like plot, character, and setting necessarily influence the text paradigms, or at least this is what I tell my students. Uh, and writing style, of course, also plays a critical role. Elements like diction, syntax, tone, foreshadowing, irony, you know, the delightful, delicious grab bag. So basically, critics are supposed to look at your standard prose narrative and we ask what is being said and how it is being said. And the same kind of holds true in cinema studies, right? So words on a page are supposed to focus the reader's attention the way a camera for a movie is supposed to tell you what is important about this scene. Video games often rely on similar elements to build their worlds. So for example, Bioshock Infinite suggests the bankruptcy of discriminatory practices by introducing the player to a world in which casual racism is practiced by villains, while sympathetic characters support values like emancipation and equality. Through rather simple narrative techniques, they give you uh, audio diaries to listen to from the city's poor and depressed, and the plot itself dynamically moves towards an eradication of uh, racial oppression in Colombia through what means oh, we, can, we can discuss later. Uh, so the game appears to take a moral stance against a society constructed on an unequal distribution of power through these narrative means and narrative techniques. But can video game criticism be built entirely on standards of reading or viewing? What about the problem of situations constructed on the affective hinge of player choice, involvement, and action? What about issues like game difficulty? Aren't there other dimensions to player experience than the unfolding of a story or the, cinema or the cinematography of cutscenes? Many scholars, gamers, and critics argue, yes. This is where this delightful buzzword comes in. Ludology is the burgeoning field of video game studies. It strives to combine analytic techniques from literary and film criticism while also attending to elements in games that seem unique to the medium. Ludology, for example, would ask us to critically attend to features of Bioshock Infinite that cannot be charted neatly within familiar critical methods. A ludological reading reveals that the driving ideology of the game holds that racism generates directly from evil people who need to be eradicated through violent means, and I will expound upon this later in my presentation. But, I will also argue, this ludological reading clashes paradoxically with the narrative's supposedly progressive politics, particularly in the jarring disconnect between the implicitly justified violence of the player's avatar and the condemned violence of the Vox Populi, the game's revolutionary faction. So what does it mean to talk about how a game builds ideology through its interface or through its player experience? Well, since the game is a first-person shooter, the player effectively sees what Booker sees and interacts with the environment via Booker's virtual body. The player, in other words, not only controls Booker's actions, but cinematically is Booker. In uh, Immersion, Engagement, and Presence, a method for analyzing 3D video games, game study scholar Allison McMahon explains that the interface of first-person shooters lends itself to high levels of what she calls player presence. This interface collapses the vision of the player and the player's avatar, which encourages players to think of the on-screen environment as that which is immediately in available to the eye. And you can see this is a shot from the game. So if we were players, right, Booker's hands are supposed to be our hands. We are seeing exactly what he sees. For the, uh, and for the Xbox console version of Bioshock Infinite, Diegetic or in-game gunfire corresponds to the extra diegetic or physical action of pulling the controller's trigger. So what we're doing with our hands is corresponding to what Booker is doing with his hands. Uh, and I mean, of course, hence the shooter part of the first person <coughs> shooter. Uh, gameplay involves skill-based aiming at targets and at enemies. Bob Rehack in his article Playing at Being asserts that, quote, interfaces are ideological. They work to remove themselves from awareness, seeking transparency or at least unobtrusiveness as they channel agency into new forms. Moreover, interfaces are discursive in that their signifying elements are organized around a continuous hailing of the human beings who use them, end quote. 
A first-person shooter, then, seems to suggest something inherent about the way people should interact with the world around them. I haven't worked out exactly what that might be, and I am, I, I'm not going to the technologically determinist it makes violent killers of us all. But it's got to mean something, right? And maybe you guys can help me kind of work out what that something is. Gonzalo Frasca, another fantastic video games scholar, has argued, quote, unlike traditional media, video games are not just based on representation, but on an alternative semiotical structure known as simulation. There are three ideological levels in simulation, according to Frasca. So how simulations or video games make arguments. Uh, firstly, the good old familiar for literary scholars, through narrative and representation, the characteristics of objects and characters, background settings, and cutscenes, but also through things like manipulation rules, what the player is able to do with the model, and through goal rules, what the player must do in order to win. So using Frasca's model as a starting point, according to the game's narrative structure, Booker has no horse in this, in this kind of racial political race. He's not in Colombia to right wrongs, and he's not actively invested in politics. So based on some kind of narrative reading, we might say that the uh, politics of Colombia aren't a main feature or a driving force. However, based on the manipulation rules, Booker does often benefit from exploring the world and learning more about the oppression of its inhabitants. So um, the desire of players to loot, to explore little nooks and crannies in order to find more ammo or more health, necessarily uncovers more about the city of Columbia than just a um, goal-driven playthrough would expose you to. And the goal rules actually involve you as Booker repeatedly killing racists in order to progress. And I would love to just show you guys a couple of minutes of gameplay to sort of ex give you a feel for the game. We're not going to look at much. But I found this clip on YouTube. There's this fantastic like, subcultural practice of uploading personal game walkthroughs to YouTube with your own audio commentary. So you get kind of a feel for how players are experiencing games for the first time. I just love these. I, I, honestly, I think they're a veritable scholarly gold mine. So this kid's fantastic. The name of this video, by the way, is I Found the KKK. Where's my audio? Yeah, it's muted. Okay, so they were pro John Wall Street because Abraham Lincoln didn't look like that. That's <laughs> 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 hilarious. <laughs> one His chairs are extremely thin. <laughs> <laughs> You'll notice it's very dark. The game is very dark. All right. I honestly considered titling my paper, I think I'm supposed to shoot them. <laughs> and that's the point, right? You are. You can technically avoid this fight. And it, it's a very obvious, there's a very obvious equivalence drawn here between this particular religious sect of bad guys devoted to racial purity and the KKK, right? I think at a later point in the video, he calls them the purple KKK. They have dark purple robes. 
So as Booker, a white male, you basically spend the first half of the game enjoying the emotional release of essentially shooting up a town full of bigots. Even though your player goals involve escaping Columbia, the morally compromised upper classes are constantly thrown in your way as enemies. So you are encouraged in your player experience to revel in the, the implied notion that enough violence is going to rid this society of racists and therefore of racism. And that's how you're encouraged to view, to view uh, racism as a player. When it comes to the narrative, though, things get a little more, um, I'll use an affective personal term here, icky. So if Booker is at the heart of the playable disruptive violence in the game, Daisy Fitzroy is at the heart of the narrative disruptive violence. Daisy, you learn early on, is a revolutionary figurehead for the Vox Populi, an illegal faction of freedom fighters for Columbia's oppressed. You come to know Daisy in the first third of the game in bits and pieces. Columbia citizens mention her with fear and awe, and Columbia propaganda paints her as this vicious, malicious criminal. You can also find tapes of her audio diaries, though, which reveal a determined woman bent on, ch bent on creating change in Columbia. So, initially, the game seems unsure how precisely to articulate the politics of the Vox Populi. It's not really explicitly linked to violence early on, but there's this major point in the game where an explosive revolution results in essentially uh, the proletariat overthrowing all of the elite of Colombia. And all of a sudden, violence doesn't seem so liberating anymore when it comes to the narrative. Daisy now becomes a maniacal enemy who sends waves of enemies at your avatar. She kills one of the city's founders, smears her face with blood, grabs his son, a nameless child who is not at all a character we've never seen before and never see again, and she brandishes her gun while declaring that the city's evil must be destroyed, quote, at the root. Elizabeth, the game's moral center, stabs Daisy with a pair of scissors to keep her from killing the young boy. So the game invests quite a bit of narrative energy repudiating disruptive violence orchestrated by a black woman while encouraging the player through a white male avatar to essentially shoot things until uh, society gets better. <laughs> Broadly, the game rejects the possibility of revolutionary change brought about internally by those who've been wronged, but supports a colonial logic that implies that an objective or just outsider can effectively use violence to right a situation. The fact that this outsider is white in this situation, I, I think, kind of speaks for itself. And the racial implications are kind of depressingly easy to see. Social disruption is, is dangerous when instigated by a black woman and righteous when led by a white man. Thank you. I'll need you to switch to YouTube at some point, but I'll let you know. All right, let me get my stopwatch here. You can go ahead and start from the beginning. You have the mouse, so you can. Oh, I guess I could have done that. <laughs> um, hi, guys. Uh, so, ooh, can you go back to the first slide? Keep going. There you go. All right, there we are. Okay, so what I'd like to do, I don't have any formal argument that I want to present. This is sort of a notes towards an argument, or maybe notes towards a methodology towards an argument. Uh, because I'm very interested in the critical framework that we use to engage games, and more particularly in its failings to account for certain kind of games. Uh, so I'm going to be looking at a different, a, a very different brand of gaming from um, the kinds of games that both Regina and Casey looked at. Um, and I'm going to try to contextualize that within a broader, within a broader sense of game <laughs> studies and give a sense of how we might look at it and how messy it becomes when we do choose to critically engage. So I want to start by talking about, click, all right, I'll play your game. Um, okay, I want to start by talking about a game that came out in 2010 titled Red Dead Redemption. It was published by Rockstar Games, infamous publishers of Grand Theft Auto and other things. Um, and Red Dead Redemption is a big open world game with a pretty linear plot set on the American West in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, and what makes this game significant for me is it has very little to do with the game itself and everything to do with how the game was heralded. The Telegraph writes that it was the best the median had to offer, and the New York Times, which had recently begun a video games column, was no less effervescent. Uh, it said even considering its technical achievements and gorgeous landscapes, most, it's most distinguished by brilliant voice acting and pungent pitch-perfect writing. 
Now, the critical formulation here is very simple. If it looks like a movie, and if it looks like a good movie, then it's also a good game. And that was pretty much it. And Rockstar, I'm sure, was enthused to get such praise. After all, they had spent $100 million on the game. And if you're going to spend the budget of a movie, you should get a movie. Um, and what's remarkable about this is a lot of people looked at Red Dead Redemption as video games coming of age. More particularly, video games coming of age into something that we could understand. And this criticism has continued. Ooh, come on, friend. There we go. Uh, all right. Has continued well into the present day. Uh, two of the most lauded games in recent years, The Last of Us and Gone Home, both received critical acclaim in basically the same language. I'm not even going to patronize you with a quote. Both movies were cinematic. They were mo monumentous. They had deep writing, provocative storytelling. The Last of Us is actually being slaved to be turned into a movie. Um, and they're both fitting so nicely into a critical framework that we can know and understand. Now, if we lose some detail in appreciating uh, video games as sort of cinematic experiences. I want to suggest that this sort of critical jump isn't a wholly bad thing. It's something that we can understand as happening, and it has to do a little bit with the way we think about games in the first place. So, on that subject, let's talk a little bit about how games work. So, I apologize if some of this is elementary, but I think really putting forward the basic structures of a game helps us understand how we're coming to the assumption that a good game looks like a good movie. So first of all, we have a game space, which is all of the code, all of the textures, all of the files, all of the cinematic games in a virtual environment. Usually this game space can only be accessed through some digital medium, let's say a television and a console. The player interacts with this experience through an avatar. And in the avatar, which is their sort of embodiment within the game, and uh, through the avatar's interaction with the game elements, a narrative is produced. Now, some games will talk about how they're nonlinear or how there might be multiple perspectives and the avatar switches. All of that is fine and good, but it essentially uses the same broad structure. In fact, a less flattering way to put this is to describe it a little bit like a rat in, the, in a maze. Um, come on, rat. Ooh. There he is. Okay, there, my rat's moving. Now, originally I was going to play, it doesn't, the event doesn't work, we don't need to worry about it. I was going to play a clip of Wolfenstein, which is a seminal 1992 DOS shooter uh, that is very boxy and very mazy, but I would suggest is not so different from the majority of single player games today. Even those with subversive open stories, such as Gone Home, or those that prevent rich nonlinear narrative, something closer to Bioshock Infinite, we're still operating in a framework where the, the scripts of the game, the walls of the maze, are already set out before the player joins. Now the player's experience of playing the game is going to change depending on which dead ends they run to, how fast they go through the maze and that kind of stuff. But we're still dealing with a rat in the maze. Now, there's another class of game, and it's a class of game that receives very little critical attention because it does not produce narratives in the same way. And that class of game is what we might call a competitive game. Now, I'm going to offer a very simple definition of competitive game, and it's meant to be capacious. So competitive games, they're offering a decision space that adjudicates a winner. That's it. So if you have a game in which you make decisions, in which a win winner is determined from player positions, you are playing a competitive game. But this sort of flips the maze paradigm on the head because it's the interaction of the players that produces the maze that we think constitutes the game. So in other words, in order for the game's narrative to emerge, there needs to be confrontation that comes from the different player positions. Okay, so on, now that we've got that kind of basic definition, I want to consider um, just, uh, oh, uh, just br briefly uh, this Frasco quote which I think um, Casey already talked about this essay, so I'm not going to go into it too much. But I just want to mention that competitive games and single-player games will look similar to one another. It just seems like competitive games don't have any plot. But the difference is the difference between playing a game of soccer and watching a game of soccer. It's elemental, and even if the experiences might look similar in the way that the game is being represented, we're dealing with two very different things. Okay, so first, a case study. Imagine a game where two players have a symmetrical... Uh, set of decisions, or we could call them pieces. And that pe these pieces interact with the game state in a variety of specific ways associated with the type of piece. In order to win this game, you need to eliminate a specific piece of mine, and I need to eliminate a specific piece of yours. And when we have our pieces in the same location, 
one of them is going to be eliminated. Now, you might recognize this as a game of chess. And in fact, these are sort of the, a basic overview of the rules. It's a little simplistic. But one of the things that we shouldn't get caught up into is this thing on the right, this is not chess, all right? This is a chess board. It's a representation of chess. Chess is the mechanical heart of the game. It's the thing that makes the game work. So if you and I are sitting down and playing a game of chess, and halfway through the game, as I begin to lose, I decide that I'm going to win this game if I change the objective. My objective is now to surround my queen with pawns. If I do that, I win. At this moment, we are no longer playing chess. I am playing some crazy variant, and you are playing by yourself. In other words, <laughs> chess requires... Come on. Right? Ah, there it is. Okay. Uh, in other words, chess requires, and all competitive games, in fact, require a social contract. Games are fragile, competitive games especially, are fragile things. Now, Bernard de Coven, who's a famous and sort of um, foundational figure in the study of play and games, in his book, The Well-Played Game, he really focuses on this fragility. We were willing, each willing to play, we're each willing to play that particular game. We, we are each willing to play with each other. We arrive at the well-played game because of the way we combine with the game. And this is the heart of what makes a competitive game different from a non-competitive game. The Last of Us, or Red Dead Redemption, exists without the players. Now, you need to go in and experience it, but the whole structure of the game is already there. People who work in devel game development will talk about the branching narratives. They can storyboard every possibility. Most competitive games have too many variables to storyboard. They don't lend themselves to this sort of narratological critique. And likewise, you cannot simply rely on the cinematic grammar to praise them. So let's consider a second case study. My hexes are funny size. OK, that should say team, not TM2. Um, <clears throat> OK, so consider another game. In this game, there are two teams, each composed of five players. Now, I've only represented them each as a single unit because in classical game theory, a multiplayer game that is formulated in teams would be rendered as simply a two-player game, and that's likewise true for this game. Now, in this game, there's an asymmetric object objective, so it's a little more complicated than chess. Team two is responsible for getting to either location A or B and planting a flag. They only have one flag to do it. They need to plant it, and they need to sit on that flag for 40 seconds, and team one has to stop them. But unlike chess, you can't see the whole board. You can only see what the players can see. So it's a first-person game like Bioshock Infinite. For the defending team, the game is about the management of information. How are they to divide their strengths between these two points, not knowing whether or not team two is going to go to A or B? Furthermore, instead of an elimination of pieces based on position, in this game, eliminations rely on position, and fl or rather, they rely on flanking and surrounding. In first-person games, and this is something that's not often explored, games like Bioshock, because you turn so quickly, but uh, the way you're looking is very important, because if someone is outside of your sight, they have a considerable advantage. So in some respects, compared to chess, this is a more subtle, a somewhat even less violent game, because it is so much more about the movement of information than a strategic capitalization on an opponent's deficit. OK, but when you look at the game itself, it appears markedly different from chess. And if you want to go ahead and cue that video. And it, uh, make sure it is playing the sound. So we're going to, the game I just outlined, we're going to watch uh, one round of it. And th this game, unlike a game of chess, which takes about an hour to play, uh, this game is played in about 60 to 90 second uh, rounds. So here we go. Uh, and, yep. With a P90, man. The drive-by that the dream, let's be honest. I kept the audio track because it's critical oh, in understanding switch. what players like. Yeah. Yeah. Yo, Lord. I love Lord. Big fan. I am Lord. <laughs> <laughs> we're not to be royals, boys. <laughs> Alright, there's a big P90 drive by coming B. Are you guys not following? 2 oh. MB, by the way, 2 MB. I repeat, 2 MB. Oh, boys, minus, minus. Do we need no. all P90s in here? Double or cat, lower tons, lower tons, down to cat, lower tons. E dude of action, lower tons. Go. Alright. We should go, we should actually go. Oh, there's a guy, lower tons. Yeah. Go, 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 go. Oh, oh it's to the right. Yeah, I got one, two. Nick, move. Go. Oh, it's got dual Redis. Oh my god, Lachlan, that was actually the biggest display of fail. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, come on, get the ball. Don't lose this. Come on, that's fine. There so you go. Right, like, when P90 oh, drive-bys oh, need oh, to happen. Alright, you can go ahead and pause. <laughs> and go back right, to the presentation. The... 
Okay, so that's horrific. Every single time I watch a video of someone playing Counter-Strike, I'm appalled by both the violence and the weird cultural milieu of Counter-Strike. Here we are enacting this strange, like, well, we're staging this strange drama where counter-terrorists and terrorists are locked in gladiatorial combat at these, in these weird, I guess we're in the Middle East, but it doesn't matter. We're in what people imagine the Middle East to be like. Now, Counter-Strike has enjoyed a popularity which is, uh, rare, rare games get to experience. The first edition of Counter-Strike came out in 2000, and it has, a, has had an active tournament scene in the 15 years since. That's three generations of video game consoles, and it's totally unprecedented in the game world, especially in terms of video games. But it has this active tournament community. Now, I don't want to suggest that we can't use a culturally informed criticism to engage with Counter-Strike. In fact, I think it's quite useful. But it doesn't allow us to understand either the game's popularity or its longevity. Because I would like to suggest, and I think this is, I think this is true, that people don't play Counter-Strike to enact this imperial fantasy no more than people play chess to pretend to be king. The thing that interests them about the game is the narratives that emerge with the meshing of the mechanics. They agree to play a game. They've decided to play Counter-Strike. In playing Counter-Strike, they produce a narrative. And it's that narrative that's critical. Furthermore, I think that Counter-Strike is actually quite aware of this. And in the recent iterations of Counter-Strike, they've moved away from the kind of mimesis which has made uh, games like The Last of Us and Red, De Red Dead Re Redemption so lauded. So compared to a game like Call of Duty, which spends a lot of time, which is a similar first-person shooter, but spends a lot of time on civilians running around the map in this more realistic setting in particular cities. The levels are called things like Baghdad, Mecca. Counter-Strike, the levels are called things like Dust, Opera. They're meant to be in this abstract world. You will never find a civilian. The flag that's being planted it was code for the terrorists planting a bomb, but the sites the bomb is planted on are usually parodic. For instance, in one of the sort of vaguely Middle Eastern levels, the bomb site is a pizza parlor on a, on a street next to a bazaar. Um, these are meant to be sort of tongue-in-cheek interactions. They're sort of playing in the milieu of this broader, I mean, in the same way that sort of James Bond is playing with Cold War anxiety or something like that. Um, furthermore, the game is really interested in undermining some of the critical assumptions of gaming. So, for instance, the avatar is a critical idea in gaming. You access the game spe space through a person. All right, and Casey outlined with brilliance what that person looks like in Bioshock and how we are supposed to sort of guess at their politics and position our own in that slot. But in Counter-Strike, you have no choice over who you represent in the game and you never get to see yourself. You don't have time to make a connection with your avatar because the matches are only 60 seconds long. And so, and at the halfway point, you switch sides with the terrorist team. And on some levels, um, you're going to see sort of like what you would imagine a Hollywood depiction of a terrorist to look like. But, on a, but the, the terrorist can be anything depending on the level, including, uh, in my particular favorite one, um, a set of neocons that are holed up in a Minnesota lake cottage. Um, and so it's the police force versus the neocons. But, the game is de-emphasizing the importance of the avatar as a character. Instead, it's a player piece. It has all of the character of a bishop or a knight or a pawn, and it's asking you to engage with the game in order to produce something else, something that's hard to see if we use our existing critical framework. Thank you. did a lot of the setup for me. I'm also <laughs> going to be talking about competitive games, um, but I will be combining it with a little bit of narrative as well. Um, I'll be presenting this paper at a conference in about a month, so if you have confusing um, ideas about what I'm saying, then please let me know so I can clarify it in the future iteration of this. All right, so my paper is League of Nations, uh, Power and Ethnicity in International Esports. All right, so I'm going to start with an introduction to competitive gaming, although Cole's already touched on a bunch of this. So competitive gaming, also known as electronic sports, also eSports, has become a multi-million dollar industry that continues to grow at exponential rates. It's also made it in terms of fame and fortune because it now has a Wikipedia page, which is titled Competitive Gaming. 
um, in 24 different languages. Um, so professional gamers can enter tournaments offering prize pools ranging from 50 grand to a million dollars. Amateurs can stream themselves playing games to legions of internet fans earning a livable income just from advertisements and subscription gifts alone. So it's a tempting career option as well. And the tournaments themselves have involved corporate sponsorships that suggest NASCAR levels of shamelessness. As you notice, there's, yeah, it just looks like NASCAR. Um, <laughs> though many different video games involve many different intersectional issues, I've chosen to focus on League of Legends team-based competitive arena because of the unique perspective its macro structure offers. At the same time that general online video games can offer the potential to dismantle national and cultural boundaries and create our own communities, international esports seems to encourage the opposite, a simplistic reversion to oriental tropes replete with reactionary, compensative narratives of racial and cultural superiority. The video game competitive scene has generated a troubling dichotomy based not on nationality, as with the Olympics, but on ethnicity-dependent conceptions of East and West. League of Legends, with its rich Asian-inspired internal lore and its legion of external investors and consumers, functions perfectly as a point of cultural friction and exchange, where global diversity meets monolithic impulses. Two, introduction to League of Legends. So League of Legends was released in 2009. It's a free-to-play game um, in which revenue is ideally generated from microtransactions, for instance, um, purchasing cosmetic changes that only aesthetically alters one's game experience. So this is known as splash art. The top left is the default art that comes free, and all others are purchased to change the look of your character as you're playing. Sometimes their weapons look different, sometimes their moves look different, but it doesn't give you any advantage whatsoever. All right, so League of Legends is part of the game style known as multiplayer online battle arenas, MOBAs for sure, short. A player controls a character, a champion, on his five-person team, and the team as a whole must, in real time, counteract the fluid strategies of the opposing team until one group's base has been infiltrated and destroyed. So Team A aims for Team B's home base and vice versa. A League of Legends is not the first of its kind, nor will it be the last. However, its popularity has outstripped those of competing longer established titles. Last year, Robert Morris University, Illinois, in Chicago, as well as a few other universities, put aside scholarships to recruit League of Legends players. Um, so they're starting young now. In the most recent Worlds Tournament, League of Legends invited the band Imagine Dragons to perform a song they'd recorded just for League. And for every new character introduced to the game, they release a music video or a short film, sometimes in collaboration with famous artists like The Crystal Method. What has kept me coming back to the specific game, though, is the constantly updating um, living lore. So every champion in the game, and there are well over 100 at this point, has a backstory, many of which interact with each other. There's revenge, love, murder, betrayal. It's a Victorian triple-decker without the 700 extra pages or Eurocentrism. <laughs> um, so while this game's developer and publisher, Riot Games, began as an American corporation in 2006, its parent shareholder as of 2011 is Tencent, a Chinese investment company. So what this indicates is that Riot has a vested interest in courting international appeal despite its localized beginnings. There's certainly no requirement to diversify, and plenty of major games don't, which makes it all the more significant that League of Legends actively engages in this type of cultural exchange, resent resulting in a complicated series of influence, appropriation, and revision. Three, behind the lore. So as I mentioned earlier, you have approximately, I think at this point, 124 champions to choose from. And from those, a significant number are clearly drawn from Asian mythologies. Some of these influences have merely been whitewashed or simplified, others are amalgamations, but all of them have been sanitized into consumable portions. So what are the oriental tropes that are worthy of remaining in play, pun intended? Uh, near and dear to my heart is Sun Wukong, the Monkey King. He is, as far as I'm aware, the only champion who is a direct copy of an existing character. Other champions are allusions or references to attributes and ideas of various cultures and mythologies. This, of course, makes it all the more ironic that Sun Wukong, who is already imbued with a complex history and tradition, becomes so one-dimensional when he transforms into League of Legends General Wukong. In China's classic novel, Journey to the West, 
He is an intelligent monkey who acts as a revolutionary against heaven. He's a monk's reluctant guardian and an enthusiastic demon hunter. He's got a busy life. Uh, eventually, at the end of his journey, he achieves enlightenment and is granted Buddhahood. So he's a pretty sacred and complicated figure of power, rebellion, and salvation. But in League of Legends, his dynamism is condensed into a single facet. Wukong desires to, quote unquote, prove himself as the best and to show the world the true power of his martial arts. So he's basically Pokemon. Right? He wants to be the very best. Even the Monkey King's name, while remaining the same phonetically, completely changes in meaning. The original mythos states that Wukong is the human name his mentor bestows on him, meaning aware of emptiness. It's meant to highlight the monkey's uniqueness and his first tiny steps to enlightenment. On the other hand, League's lore states that Wukong is a reference to the fictional fighting art of Wuju. General Wukong is thus entirely defined by his martial abilities. He's intimidating and impressive, certainly, but utterly lacking the spiritualism that ultimately defines his significance in Chinese culture. On the other hand, League of Legends has no problem creating rich backgrounds for other mixed Euro-Asian figures. Yosuo, the game's answer to Tom Cruise of The Last Samurai, um, is framed for the murder of his mentor, exiled in search of the real killer, and in the process, sadly, kills his brother. Um, Udir, let's see, come on Udir. Uh, is a man who can channel animal spirits. He wears the garb of a monk, but his past is far from peaceful. His mentor slain in front of him, Udir basically goes crazy for a little while. Even the masked ninjas of the game are given elaborate lures of betrayal, vengeance, and pride. So then, why is it that every single allusion to specific Asian mythologies falls flat? Nine-tailed fox, Ari, is a seductive killer who begins to feel remorse, as nine-tailed foxes do. Um, Nasus is an Anubis lookalike who roams the desert, a god on earth. And Xin Zhao, an East Asian general, is known only for his loyalty. Where champions are explicit representations of a primary oriental influence and their physical bodies are distinctly other, their lore becomes restricted to characteristics that are suggestive of general stereotypes. There's a struggle here to contain and revise ethnic markers so that they're palatable, consumable in a capitalist market. To quote Palumbo Liu, this type of social discourse that set up conventions for both communication and behavior creates and maintains norms that convert otherness to sameness. Cultural and ethnic diversity become comfortable, traditional oriental representations that offer hints of the exotic and mysterious while remaining marketable. Before we move on to the structural complexities of the sorts, um, which Cole talked about, there's one last set of splash art that I'd like to take a look at. So unlike the other instances of deliberate cultural pruning, this one registers as genuine confusion. So confusion over what suffices as an appropriate level of appropriation, and confusion over the most basic and fraught of ethnic markers, skin color. So I want you to meet Karma, the enlightened one. Um, here's her original art. So this was a few years ago. And here's her updated free art. Um, as you can see in the original, um, she's known for her offensive and defensive abilities, a dualism that is emphasized in her original art by the black and white yin yang dress. Um, she seems to represent a fusing of Taoist philosophy and South Asian religion. In her revamped default, the East Asian influence is eliminated, an adjustment reflected not only in her dress, but her increased bust size, her darker skin tone, and a broader nose. In another purchasable skin called Order of the Lotus, the title most likely a reference to China's White Lotus Society, her skin is now lightened, her body less curvy, her dress conservative, and her nose petite. I think this one is self-explanatory, um, so we're just going to move on to this one. Uh, the Sun Goddess. That, if anything, to me, emphasizes the disorientation the artist must have felt when confronted with a character who is defined purely by her ethnic features. Returning to conceptions of indigenous people as primal forces of nature, the artists have slimmed her to androgynous muscle and bone, flattened her chest, and toned her skin to a, a sun-kissed bronze. It sounds romantic, but it's not. Um, unlike the other Asian-inspired figures I've mentioned, Karma has no role to anchor her. She's not a god, she's not a monk, she's not a warrior, she's not a fox demon. She is Karma, the vague incarnation of Eastern philosophies and Oriental sexuality. 
With no iconic gear or specific mythos, Karma has only the color of her skin and the shape of her body to denote the various mysteries of the vast Orient. And apparently these mysteries include South America, South America by virtue of a sliding scale of brownness and a spectrum of femininity. Despite or perhaps because of the importance of Asian culture in the construction of game environment and the prominence of Asian players in the international scene, global tournaments have been tainted by regional tensions. In the same fashion that League's world marketability is dependent on the inclusion and careful containment of Asian influences, so too is its viability as a competitive sport. The increasingly popular um, profitable sports industry in North America and Europe is reliant on the economic and cultural infrastructures previously set in place by gaming giants like South Korea and China. With the number of league fans equaling those of the NBA this past year, massive corporate sponsorships, and growing amounts of prize money on the line, it's no surprise that teams are also trading players, with North American and European teams consistently drafting, importing, players from East Asian countries. Though this occasionally raises nationalist hackles, it was not until recent events that nationalism was definitively overshadowed by ethnic regionalism. So whereas the lore and aesthetic content of League aligns with current post-colonial readings of texts that attempt to naturalize the foreign, the socio-political dimensions of League's competitive structure involve the production of very familiar virtual borders and the scramble for gaming hegemony. So um, what I want you to focus on is the way that they split. EU stands for Europe, NA stands for North America, and then Asia is Asia. Um, yeah, there is of course here the trope of the creative West that creates revolutionary video games and the drone-like East that functions as an immovable, technically skilled behemoth that ultimately dominates the landscape of professional gaming. If you play StarCraft, there's the same language going on. Um, until the world championships every year, the primary heated rivalry is North America versus Europe. They get pretty nasty with each other. But enter South Korea or enter China and the map reorients itself. Now North America and Europe must band together to topple the Goliath that is East Asia. This was complicated in 2014 uh, when a Chinese-based Le League of Legends team, LMQ, permanently moved to the U.S. and qualified for the North American Championship <laughs> Series. Yeah. So this sparked questions of nationality and global representation. Could a team full of Chinese-born citizens ever truly represent North America in international tournaments? Evidently not. Um, or are they North America in name only, forever a reminder of foreign encroachment? And I, I will say, there were a lot of people who were arguing that, you know, if you move to America and you go through the process, you are American, so you should count as North American. But um, there were plenty that did not like it. Um, there is no national pride to be found, for if LMQ wins, it's still a victory for China. Green cards, citizenship, and nations are meaningless when Americanness is defined by fluency in English, cultural assimilation, and length of residency. Now, to be fair, this border drawing is not so much about the sweeping rejection of all other cultures and ethnicities as it is a rejection of form and denomination. North American teams composed of Asian American players are legitimate, and North American teams with all European players can dodge criticism. It's only when the ethnic other has not been properly domesticated by Western traditions and cannot be combined to porous national boundaries that the instinctive reliance on monolithic West versus monolithic East comes into play. In this way, uh, racism can be deflected by the pretense of nationalism and competitive fairness. Sometimes, though, that's not enough. In September 2014, a few months after Ellen Q moved to U.S., during the World Championships, Danish professional esports player Sven Skeren was caught making racist remarks towards a Taiwanese fan while he was in Taiwan during the tournament. Um, so what are we to take away from the sorry, not sorry apology provided not by the player, but by the actual organization that represented the team? They were sorry that people were offended. Um, when Sven Skeren renamed himself Taipei Ching Chong, it sounds, where's the, there we go. There. So he, Sven Skera, renamed himself Taipei Ching Chong, and that's the Taiwanese fan. He um, was creating, not creating, he was invoking an uncreative racial insult to denote and deride the foreign other, who is so other that he cannot even understand he's being mocked. So Taipei Ching Chong exempts Asians whose ethnic differences have been moderated to more acceptable and accent free levels. So what these recent events of League have shown us is that with a new, this time digital world map to be explored, conquered, and parceled out, 
artificial narratives of power and superiority must once again be constructed. So we can't really deal with video games like these as just kind of static words or images on a page. We must analyze not just the game itself, but the activity of being in that game. So the in-game choices that players make, the competitive stages that have been built around them, and the markets which profit from both are creating a flexing space that actively overlays and reshapes our global relationships. Thank you. Okay, I found those to be all super fascinating papers. Unfortunately, we have a pretty brief amount of time for questions, although we have the lovely transition period as like a little buffer. So um, let's, let's field some questions at this time. So if you have questions, I think I don't need to be a part of that. You can just direct them directly to the, um, to the panel here. presentation as it is at this stage, do any of you feel like you would make an adjustment to your own argument based on what someone else presents its bed? I would keep pull around and just have him start first and then ever talk about video games and then I have a layout for me. It's funny you said that because I was actually thinking about how odd my piece was in the relationship, just because I was looking at like a kind of a different kind of narrative formation. Um, so because originally we, we sort of talked a lot about the organization of the panel, kind of like who should start. Uh, because originally I think I was slated to go first, but it didn't it didn't make sense because like I, my favorite is like move from one type of game to another. Um, yeah, so I, I mean I, I don't know. I mean I think one of the things that I didn't talk about and I would I'd love to talk about in a, a longer paper is. This is why <laughs> yeah, I would have gone there too. Uh, is the the environment around Counter Strike, which is this weird marketplace of designable and sellable content, and it, it was it was tangential to my paper because I'm more interested in the critical framework. But it has it's similar to the league, except except you know league selling of skins, but it's extremely anarchic because anybody can upload things, anybody can sell things. I think I've made, I mean, you make tons of money playing Counter Strike because you get random items and you just sell them because there's this bustling market of people like purchasing those things. It's a very fascinating. I know, you're so. like running a black market. Oh, you're you're already already the you made. The it's biggest absurd. or like largest scale example of that is Second Life, which is crazy. Right. Have you guys seen right. the documentary about Second Life merchants? Like people who literally make their entire living selling digital clothing and skins on Second Life? Plan B after grad school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are, I mean, there are also people who play WoW, you know, and buy accounts and then like farm and then sell those accounts. And there's an article about it funding terrorism somewhere. Yeah, like that. It's it's a way to, to help shift money. Yeah. But if I could piggyback, oh wait, I want to hear from you. But yeah, I want to piggyback. Gonna, I was going to wrench it away from competitive gaming and okay. bring it back to games that are intentionally trying to get the player to experience a narrative. Mm -hmm. So Regina, your exploration of this very weird Easter egg moment where the company making the game confronts the problematic of having its white male demographic experience the black female other. It made me really want to explore the uh, additional downloadable content yes. for Bioshock Infinite that was released in March 2014, so a couple years removed from the game. But this downloadable content tried very tangentially and very briefly, but but tried to recover Daisy Fitzroy as this heroic individual who's not actually a, a murderer or driven by malicious villainy, but who was intentionally martyring herself for a, a larger cause. So that, I, th I think there's this interesting impulse that is increasingly present in the industry to deal with representations <coughs> of the racial other, and I mean black women in, in the case of both of our games. That sounds better though, because I was still confused. You showed this clip to me last, a few days ago. I thought it was a parody. And I didn't understand yeah. it was an Easter egg until today. I still thought it was a parody for the past three days. And I was like, I don't understand how this works in our presentation. Because women, women have a better sense of balance, and, and men think about sex all the time. That was just well, and also the fact that it's in 1981. 
Or there's yeah, something like in which they want to say like if you don't aren't already like in 1981 men should have already been confronting these things and yet somehow in 2015 this is not the case like you go to a comment board and it doesn't happen that way and I thought something that was interesting in Casey's talk that I would um and you know again I actually had other things that I wanted to show in context but just not no not time for that I was thinking also about how in the game unlike Booker DeWitt and Bioshock Infinite um in Assassin's Creed um four um, you don't, you get to play as like Edward Kenway the pirate, but like he's still like his body is separate from yours. Um, and when you're in the frame story, you actually don't see hands or anything that tell you what race or what gender you are. I think that there's some like masculine pronouns used to like, like when they're talking at you, but it's, uh, it is unclear. Um, but I imagine from like, I, it would be interesting to think about like, the frame character being like, is he supposed to be a white male? Whatever it is, watching this, like listening to this audio log of this white male playing like a black woman. Like, what does that, what is that supposed to do? Like, how, it, are, do they, how, are they assuming that a white male is listening to a white male embodying a black woman? I just, I don't know, that's Avatar. Yeah, it's, it's very inception-y, you're right. So Casey, you've just made me think of something really interesting that sets video games apart from like um, books and movies is that developers can update them, um, yes. not just through DLC, but like let's say you update it and change the story uh, based on reactions, and like it, it could be in like an evolving narrative um, that users can still kind of contribute to, even in games like Red Dead Redemption, which is this like presented as the story, they could change it, tweak it in ways after it comes out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, is there? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's simultaneously brilliant and problematic too, right? right? Because how how can you ever really fully critique Bioshock Infinite. I mean, I, I can I can honestly see the YouTube comment now. Why do you not know, talk about DLC? Ridiculous. <laughs> totally wrong about Daisy Fitzroy. <laughs> you know, play DLC, hack. So there are these solitary, isolated units of games that are given to the community. The community digests them, comments on them, and then good companies, responsible like progressive companies, will try to take that feedback and work with it in some way, which, I mean, Ken Levine really does. Not not enough. That's a different conversation, but it, yeah, I totally agree. No, the updates is true. Sorry, I was just thinking totally just, mm -hmm. um, Guild Wars 2 had an update for April Fools, and you could just go around and pretend to be an airplane and make airplane sounds <laughs> in the game. That was it. That's all I <laughs> yeah, they have like monthly updates, and that was just a few months. Well, I mean, this is like an interesting like textual problem, because if we think it's bad now, like it's going to be really bad in 30 years or 40 years or 50 years, right? Um, and so I was like, I think that's one of the reasons when I was kind of trying to imagine how to like map what a single player experience is, I sat on the maze as metaphor because it, th there is like a wider space, right? Like narratives, when we think of them in print, they're linear by necessity of the fact that that's the way that language works, right? So you're going to get things in order, even if it's a choose your own adventure, in which case our metaphor becomes like a branching tree or something, but it's also weird like these documents are in flux and we've got things that are being added and taken away. I mean, I think version number, I mean, these are the kinds of concerns that like, future video game scholars are gonna have to really think about because, I mean, if you think about Bioshock Infinite is thousands and thousands of mazes because we're dealing with different iterations of the game, different difficulty settings, different patch numbers, so it makes it into a very difficult text. Um, that makes our current worries about which edition more ridiculous we're going to see what they're trying. And you yourself told me there was an argument, right, that if the game patches, you are now playing a totally different game, right? No longer counts. So if I'm playing League of Legends a month ago, it's a totally different game from League of Legends now. Right, it's so like it's a different text. Yeah. Yeah. And none of the stuff is difficulty, like difficulty yeah. settings and yeah. skill, really, which I think is somebody somewhere is going to have to. <laughs> right. okay, I'm going to take, take privilege of last question. So do we come out in the end on it's video game culture or it's video game anarchy because I saw some anarchic elements. I see these structural differences between single player and its role for mimesis versus competitive and mimesis is more like a supporting role. It seems to be there but it's not necessarily there in the same way that in, you, know, you need some sort of representational element to have these single player experiences. So I saw that difference but when you look at the mimesis which is there as Lily's presentation kind of points out I mean, there's that so seems to be the culture, like going through each of your um, arguments is like, they're all kind of Eurocentric. So what do you, I came away thinking, yeah, it's video game culture and it's Eurocentric and it's masculinist. 
But is that like the wrong reading of your all's panel? Is that simplistic? Do you disagree? I mean, Are I, there so I would say that the narrative generation of competitive games is completely anarchic. And, I, and not only that, I would say that like the anarchy fuels the sense of discovery in the game, the fact that like we're generating these things together, that we don't need the structures around it. And I think this is something that gets borrowed in the single player games. Because Bioshock Infinite wants to convince you Right, that you're sort of in bot, like you're in this open world. I mean, open world games are about convincing you that you're in this like anarchic and free space. But of course, like there is an error. You have to you have to shoot the people in the purple hoods. Okay, I, I'm going to push back against that a little bit because even if we're suggesting that somehow narrative techniques for looking at competitive games are insufficient, mm -hmm. I mean. As Lily's paper, I think, emphasizes really nicely, nationalist and regionalist and e e discourses concerning ethnicity are still very much there. So in the competitive scene of Dota 2, there was a, a championship a couple years ago, international championship, really huge prize pool. Dota 2 is also a big thing, like yeah. the Legends and Competitive Game. We're rivals right now. <laughs> We're playing rival games. Oh boy. <laughs> so, there's this huge prize pool a couple years ago for this championship between two European teams. That international deciding final, the narratives of the specific plays that won the game are, are famous, or infamous. Everybody knows about S-Force, Dream Coil, Puck. Fast forward a couple years to the uh, uh, final between a couple of Chinese teams, very little kind of narrative buzz about the, what, how the games actually transpired. General like consensus for like North American and European access web spaces is it's boring. Yeah, I mean, I guess you know, just to sort of clarify my, my position, I'm not like I'm not talking about the meta narratives that we generate about the, the games. In which case, I think those meta narratives, as, as Lily, as you noted, the case that you just said, you're of course going to find them wrapped up in all of the cultural biases and prejudices and problems. What I'm suggesting is the actual play of the game is anarchic. Yeah. Because yeah. it doesn't like they can't hear the announcers, right? They're like they're yeah. I mean they're headphoned out and they're they are their whole experiences are being mediated through this. There are announcers and analysts for, for these competitive right, games. This, so, yeah. you know, like like football or something. Right, right. <laughs> and so I think that within the space of the game, we can get this like anarchic narrative generation that gets co-opted and turned into the East versus West trope or whatever. Yeah. And I think that there's a co-opting happening. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense. Okay, well thanks very much. I